so many good things at our church. Um, if you weren't here last week, last week was absolute pure insanity. All right? A bunch of crazy church people inviting everyone they know to church. And, um, you know, I want to encourage you, that's not just for an event. Uh, like we talked about, we're inviting people in. When we invite them to church, we're not just inviting them to hear a preacher. We want them to be engaged and community, and we get to talk a little bit about that today as we come to the slow end of our study of the book of Galatians. For those of you who don't know, the context of the book of Galatians is that the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the churches in the region of Galatia, that is modern day Turkey, and he's writing them to clear up a foundational theological belief that basically Christ is enough. What was happening was the Apostle Paul came to them and he preached this gospel that you are justified, meaning you are right before God by faith in Christ alone. And that is enough to justify you before God. But there was this group gaining influence, influence, we go again. influence <laughs> in the lives of the people of the church. And their message was this, that yes, you can believe in Jesus, but the only way you remain right before God is if you live up to obedience to the law. Everyone say the law. law. Now, the tension here is not that the law is bad or contrary to Jesus, but Jesus came to fulfill it. So the law was paid for. The law was fulfilled. And through your faith in Christ, we have now the opportunity to walk freely as a child of God rather than someone bound to rules, regulations, and statutes. All right? We are free to be children of God. Okay? rather than be slaves to the law. But some of the people in the Galatian churches were beginning to choose this way rather than the way of the gospel that the Apostle Paul preached. And what was birthed was legalism. Legalism is when you take something good and make it sacred. Legalism is sticking more to rules than a person. Legalism cares more about systems than the Savior. And so there was this real great tension in the church. And the Apostle Paul, through chapters 1 and 2, is... Saying, guys, here's what's going on. Here's what you need to remember. You're justified by faith. He tells them this is why freedom is important. And then he tells them, hey, this is how you become free. And in these last couple of chapters, what we've seen is, hey, now that you are free in Christ, what you need to know is that you're not just free from something, but you're free for something. Everyone said amen. amen. Right? That our freedom is to be used, not just something that we hold close and dear to our heart, but there's actually a way of living freely, right? So last week we talked a little bit about living fruitful lives, walking in step with the Spirit. The week before that we talked about running our race well. And what we're going to see today is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. So this sermon, if I'm going to be honest, I, I, I may get loud, and I apologize. <laughs> I may get a little bit passionate, and I don't apologize, but I believe in this. And I believe in this because of I, the experiences that I've had and what I believe to be true in Scripture. And the truth is this, that we were created for interpersonal relationships. Amen. Everyone said amen. amen. That we're not meant to just do life by ourselves, but we're meant to be living in community. Now, what we're going to see in our text is a couple things. Paul's going to talk a little bit about interpersonal relationships. He's going to talk a little bit about money. Whoa. Money in church. Everybody, everybody calm down. All right? Promise you. The Apostle Paul is saying it, not Austin. So everybody just breathe. Okay? And it's important because guess what? Your life is full of those things. This will apply to our lives. Amen. I love that the Bible is still relevant each and every day. And here's what we're going to see, that we are free in Christ for engagement. Everyone say engagement, engagement in meaningful community. That we are meant to be a part of it. That we are made for relationship first and foremost with God. But from that relationship with God, we are designed to be in relationship with others. You hear me? Yes. Yes. That we're designed for interpersonal relation, relationships. And the Apostle Paul it's going to say, hey, on the backside of telling you what it looked like to be a spirit-led person or a spiritful person, someone who walks in step with the Holy Spirit, someone who's pursuing fruitfulness, here's what it looks like when a community of people, when a group of people are living spirit-led. Here's what a spirit-led community can look like. Are you hearing me today? Yes. 
Yes. It is quiet. Maybe it's just the fact that this morning has been wild. Are you hearing me? <laughs> it's been a wild morning, Reggie. Goodness gracious, but the Lord is good, and here we are. <laughs> the Apostle Paul is going to get, give us some distinctions between what a spirit-led community looks like and other communities look like. This is how we will be known, okay? That we're not, the local church is not just a social gathering. Are you hearing me? Yes. <laughs> the, the local church is not just a club. Right? None of those things are bad, but what we need to know is there are distinctions. There are things that set us apart as a community. And the Apostle Paul is going to dive deep into some of those distinctions today. But what we know to be true, if you've walked the earth for any amount of time, if you've been in any interpersonal relationships, if you've let anyone else into a part of your life, people are messy. <laughs> People are messy. Relationships are messy. Churches are messy. Are you hearing me? But what we need to know today, and a belief I pray you get in your heart, is that people are a mess worth making. You hear me today? Let's jump into the text. We're actually going to start in the last verse of chapter 5 and go through part way of chapter 6. This is what the Apostle Paul says. Let us not become conceited, provoking... And envying each other. That's how he ends chapter 5. And then he jumps into chapter 6. Saying, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Everyone say gently. gently. <laughs> but watch yourselves, or you, also, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks that he is something... When they are not, they deceive themselves. Pretty intense. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing. Everyone say comparing. comparing. The Bible is so relevant. Themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Everyone say all. all. I wonder if I looked up the Greek. Do you know what that word means? It means all. <laughs> <laughs> Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Some translations would say the household of faith. I would say the spirit-led community. You hear me? My title today is this. We are free for meaningful. That's the big word. I want you, meaningful community. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for your word. It's alive and active. Thank you for everyone gathered here today. We pray for those who couldn't be with us, whether it was illness or family situations. And God, uh, again, as we, as we are reading this text today, knowing what's going on in the life of CMA, I pray that you would convict us to carry one another's burdens today. That we would be willing to enter into the mess of people. That we would be willing to walk into the darkness carrying light. In Jesus' name, everyone say. Amen. Amen. And amen. Before we talk about engaging in or playing our part in spirit-filled, spirit-led, meaningful community, we must first deal with what might keep us from it. Okay? Okay. Galatians 5.26 says, Let us not become what? Conceited, provoking, and envying one another. Why? Because selfish, selfishness will keep you from community. That's where we're going to start today. It'll get better, but here's what we need to know. A lot of us are alone. And, and I'm not saying you're not surrounded by people, but you're not really engaged in any community. 
Because we've geared our lives solely around the affairs of our own. Are you hearing me? Yes. Conceit, provoking, and envy are all rooted in selfishness. In the heart of Christian community, the heart of spirit-filled, spirit-led community, is a willingness to look beyond oneself to see others. It's a willingness to, yes, we have our own needs, but we are willing to put others' needs before our own. That yes, we have preferences, but our preferences take a back seat for the greater good of the whole. That's the heart of Christian community. But if we're only thinking of ourselves, right? I'm going to come to church. I hope I get something from it. Right? Are you hearing me? I hope that this is good for me. And I hope it is too. I'm not saying any of this is wrong. I'm saying it cannot be the primary or the determining factor in the way we do spiritual community. Right? That yes, we have our preferences, we have our own needs, we have our own concerns, but we're willing to engage in community by, by pursuing selflessness. Everyone say selflessness. selflessness. Why would we pursue selflessness in an incredibly selfish world? In a world that tells us to go out and earn it, go out and get it yourself, go out and accumulate it, keep it all to yourself, and just keep building up your stuff. Here's why we would pursue selflessness in spaces and in groups like this. Because the king of the kingdom we're a part of modeled a behavior that was selfless. And you'll never, you'll never pursue selflessness if you serve the wrong king. You hear me? Right, Paul David Tripp is a, is a great author and a great preacher and pastor and a doctor. And he says this, the kingdom of self is a small kingdom. I love that. It's real small if you're like 5'5". Five, five. <laughs> the kingdom of self is an incredibly small kingdom. But you and I who are in Christ are free for His kingdom. Are you hearing me? The good news is this. That you don't have to settle for a small kingdom. That you don't have to live your life solely for yourself. That you can, you can with God's help, put others' needs before your own. That you can let your preferences take a back seat to whatever God might be doing. Are you hearing me? That you're not stuck to just serve the kingdom of yourself. That would be what? That would be sowing into the flesh. Thus we will reap what the flesh brings and that is destruction. Are you hearing me today? Yes. The kingdom of self is an incredibly small Kingdom, But the good news is you and I who are in Christ do not have to settle for the kingdom of self. Meaningful community is sacrificial, not self-seeking. You hear me today? Yes. That is not fun, if I'm honest. And it's not easy. And it's not always our default setting. But the way of this kingdom modeled by this king who laid down everything... For the greater good of others and obedience to his father. You hear me today? Yes. That it's a pursuit of selflessness. And guess what? Don't beat yourself up. We are all pretty bad at this. Right? We're all pretty bad at it. Also at the same time, don't just settle and be like, eh, it's just who I am. <laughs> Have you done any work? And selflessness. I remember when Keely and I got married and she changed the bedspread on the bed. I lost my ever loving mind. <laughs> I was like, ma'am, I am 26 years old at this point. I have life established. I don't need you, okay? Don't be coming in. She's not here today, so. Uh, don't be coming in here putting all these floral blankets on my bed. What are you doing? And it was in that moment that I was like, wow, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> also, I've got to find somewhere to sleep tonight. <laughs> but our pursuit in this kingdom, because of this king we have, is to not seek what's good for self, but to be willing to sacrifice for what's greater and good. Amen. Amen. In, 6, 1, in Galatians 6, 1, Paul says, As brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may be tempted. 
We're going to start to see some of those distinctions now. And the first one is this meaningful community seeks to restore, not to retaliate. The believer's response to the sin of another will tell you where they are in their spiritual formation. How we handle the sin of someone else actually tells the story about you. You hear me? You can tell someone is full of the Spirit by how they interact with something that they don't like. And here's how immaturity responds. It responds much like the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 as he saw a tax collector and he's praying to God. And he prays to God and he says, God, thank you, I'm not like that man. And it would be real easy as believers to see the sin of someone else. And by the way, the sin the Apostle Paul is talking about, it's not this intentional uh, rejection of God. He says it's almost entrapping. It's something someone has like small compromise, small compromise, small compromise, and boom. Now they're captured by this sin. They probably never meant to get there, right? No one wakes up one day and says, let's destroy my marriage. Let's become an addict. It doesn't just happen in a day. It's someone that has found themselves Trapped And what's real easy in this faith community, in the local church, not just ours, everyone, is to say, oh my goodness, can you believe what's going on with so-and-so? Or to, or to baptize it with, I'm only telling you this so you can pray. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you are. But the truth is, the way we handle the sin of someone else actually tells a lot about us. And you see, when you pursue selflessness, your, your, what you see when you see someone else broken is you see yourself and where you were. And today, this week, and I, guys, I'm, I'm just, I don't know how many notes I'm going to get to today. This week, I talked to literally my spiritual hero, my mentor. He's, he's, I, would, I would go real close to calling him a spiritual father type of my life. He's too young for that, and he would be really disappointed if I said that, but he is. And him and I were talking about some of the things going on in in our mutual circles and people we know and all the tough stuff that comes sometimes with ministry. And by the way, let me just tell you something. Some of you guys go and work jobs for 12, 18 hours. Listen, I'm not complaining about what I do. God is, I'm grateful to be here. This is a privilege. This is not, a, I'm not about to play no victim, nothing like This is a privilege and an honor, and I'm responsible for how I handle it. Are you hearing me? That was free. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> we were talking about some of the things in our mutual circles that are going on. And it's like left and right, our friends, our people, our, our, our people we believe in, people we empower, people we entrusted are getting picked off left and right. And my mentor looked me dead in the face, and he said, Austin. He said, you are one or two decisions at all times from giving away every good thing that you have. That's right. He said, keep that on the forefront. And it's like I'm hearing the Apostle Paul say in verse 3, hey, if you think you've got it while you're wrestling with someone else's struggle, why don't you remind yourself that you don't? That it is only by the grace of God that you are not in the same spot that they're in. How we handle the sin of someone else matters and how we respond to it as a spirit-led meaningful community is we take the posture of gentleness and humility and we seek to restore and our humility it's rooted in a realization that that could be me that maybe i maybe one or two decisions changed my course but that could just as easily be me who's entrapped to that thing or with that sin as it is somebody else. And so we must take the posture of humility and gentleness, a fruit of the Spirit, evidence of the Spirit's work in your life. You hear me? Our human nature would much rather beat someone down. Our human nature would much rather run away from the mess. Our human nature would rather just excuse it or push it under the rug or ignore it or just hope it gets better for him or say a prayer here and not actually engage in the mess. But you and I are not called to run away from the mess of people in community. We are called to get in it with them. The Apostle Paul says, be careful lest you be tempted also. And that's twofold. That is, yes, some of us shouldn't go toward near certain things. Because it's a recipe for you to slip back into things. Yep. Are you hearing me? Yep. And you can love that person differently. Yep. 
But there's another temptation of taking that person's mess and comparing it to my mess and saying, hmm, I'm not doing that bad. <laughs> and that's just as big of a sinful temptation as it is to slip back into an addiction. You hear me? We enter into people's mess gently, humbly. And when we do, we have just created an opportunity for someone to encounter what it's like to encounter the real life Jesus. When they expect finger pointing and yelling. When they expect harshness and discipline. When they, when they expect punishment. When they expect to uh, guilt trip. When they expect you have to do better. And you enter into that mess and into that darkness humbly and gently and honestly. And say, oh, honestly, this could, this could be me too. You've just created an encounter with the gospel that says Christ is for people. He's not for sin. He's not. But he is for the people that are trapped and want to get out like a woman caught in adultery in John 8. Like a leper who can't go towards his hometown in Luke 17. He wants people to come back to himself. And his people, his body on earth, have a responsibility to reflect him well in meaningful community. Amen? I got to speed up. Okay? Verse 2 says this, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Anyone, if anyone thinks that they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Paul tells the Galatians to carry each other's burdens. And when we expose ourselves to the burdens of other people, it's a... Great temptation, as we've said before, to compare ourselves to the burdens someone else is carrying. And to avoid this or to overcome this, we must get back to remembering that we are living life by the Spirit. Everyone say the Spirit. Spirit. Which means what? That my measuring stick is Christ. I'm not comparing my life to someone else's life. I'm, I'm looking at my life through the lens of am I being obedient to Christ? Am I following the promptings of the Holy Spirit? Am I doing what He says? Am I pursuing what He would have me Pursue. When we run to the mess of people, we do it not out of a hero complex. We do it because God loves people. Hear me. Amen. God loves people. God loves people a whole lot. We don't enter the mess to tell people that they are messed up. We enter the mess because God loves people. We bear one another's burdens because God loves people. And here's why it's important. Because burden bearing matters. Because it's ex it exposes our darkness to light so that the darkness might not continue to progress in our hearts. When people bring their burdens into a safe place or a safe person and they can openly and honestly share. Hear me. That's when light can get in. The longer we leave something in the dark, the more it grows and grows and grows and grows and grips and grips and grips and grips. It needs exposed to the light of Jesus. And you have an opportunity and a responsibility as a believer of Christ to carry this light. And in turn, some of you are in here today and yeah, that sounds good, Austin, but I'm dealing with something myself. You need someone to help you and walk with you and bear your burden. You need to take your burden somewhere. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Some of us in this room have, have never shared the real struggles that we deal with. Whether it's safety issues, whether it's church hurt, whether it's past struggles, whether it's experiences, when we have been honest and open, I'm going to encourage you today. I'm just going to encourage you that this risk is worth taking. That burden bearing is a risk worth taking. That sharing my struggles and being on and letting light into my darkness is worth it. Because Jesus can bring light to your darkness. Don't put your hope in a person. Put your hope in Jesus, right? But in doing so, we, we've just got to start to just take the risk. Take the chance and say, yeah, honestly, I am struggling with this. And you need to tell someone rooted in faith that knows Scripture, that wants the best for you, that wants the best for the greater good. You hearing me today? I've really got to keep going. I just want to stay in parts of this. <laughs> Quit trying to do it all yourself. Quit trying to carry it all yourself. You can't. 
And on the other side today, as a believer in this room, hear me, especially if you call this church home. When's the last time you asked someone how they're doing? Not in passing, but with intent and pressing in and leaning in. Saying, hey, are you doing okay? When's the last time you followed up with someone that six months ago told you about something? Right? It's our it's not just our responsibility, it's a privilege, it's an honor, it's an opportunity to show people who Jesus is by bearing one another's burden. It's what meaningful community does. We all walk a, walk a little bit lighter because everyone's carrying it. Right? Am I making sense today? Yeah. Verse 4 says this, Each one of you should test your own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Meaningful community is comprised of people who humbly take responsibility for their own lives. Amidst our burden bearing, amidst our being willing to enter into the mess, we must remember something. We are responsible for ourselves, right? You can't control what other people do. You can only be engaged in community. But you are responsible for you. You are responsible to be obedient yourself. You are responsible to do what is asked of you by Christ. Like you are responsible to be engaged in community if you are a believer. We're not responsible for the lives of others. But it's hard to share light with people. We haven't exposed our own darkness. So what darkness are you letting live inside of you that you like you need to take responsibility for it? And put that thing into the light. Because when that thing gets put into the light, you realize how much greater Jesus is than that darkness. But that's on you. That's not on anybody else. You hear me? I would even say this meaningful community is full of people who are willing to constantly examine themselves. Not to pursue perfection or getting it right all the time, but so that we know where we are. We can be honest with where we are in our formation. Verse 6 says this, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from their flesh will reap destruction. Destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. And here's what you need to hear today, that the context of this is tricky. Most scholars, most theologians, most people who know what they're talking about will tell you the Apostle Paul is telling the Galatian churches to basically <laughs> to financially help the people teaching them. I'm not saying that today, okay? Everybody calm down. <laughs> but you need to know the context of the Bible. You need to know what's going on. And I would much rather you hear a principle in it than the actual practice of what they're doing, okay? Right? What he's saying basically is like, hey, you have spiritual burdens. The guy teaching you has physical burdens, Meet each other's burdens. Yep. You all have something to offer. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Right? The Bible says we're one body, many members. We all have gifts. We all have things. We all have uh, time, talent, and treasure. And what we do with that time, talent, and treasure can be sowing into the spirit and things of the spirit. Or we can sow into the flesh. And the results are very clear in the text. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And meaningful community is generous. It looks for the needs of other people. It tries to help other people. It tries to help people within the household of faith. Are you hearing me? Yeah. That's not about offering plates or offering boxes. That's not about mission funds and building. It's not about any of that. It's about looking to serve and love people. Right? Isn't that good news? They, I know they're talking about money in church. And by the way, this is probably the most abused money text in Scripture by people like me who get up on stages all across the world, specifically in America. I love America, but specifically here in the West, we love to take this, twist it, turn it, give to our church, give to our people, give to our things. Let me just tell you, that's all that stuff, you and God can figure that out. But what I have a responsibility to tell you is that we are called to be generous people. What you do with that, you're responsible for. But practicing generosity is our hand reminding our hearts that everything that we have is on loan to us, not owned by us. Open-handed living. Letting things come to us and get through us. You hear me today? That's good. I like it too. I worked hard on it. But it's true. 
practicing generosity is our hand reminding our heart. Everything that we have is on loan to us, not owned by us. Everyone say steward. steward. You are a steward of all that you've been given. Some of you are like, I work really hard for all I have. Amen. You did. God gave you that ability to work hard. Right? Some of you are like, I, I, I spent X amount of time working on this thing. Yes, you did. And praise God for it. And you are working hard. And you are doing things. And you do. Des- I'm not saying you don't deserve, but I'm saying the source of that thing is God. He gave you the idea in the first place. He gave you the resources, the connections. He gave you all the things that you need. Everything is owned by him and stewarded by us. So we live our lives open-handed to remind our hearts consistently. God occupies the heart. Money doesn't occupy the heart. Time doesn't occupy the heart. Career doesn't occupy the heart. If I'm a believer, God is in complete ownership of the heart. Amen. God knew at the very beginning of time that people would really struggle with money and it overtaking the desires of their hearts, right? No one said amen. (laughs) I'm in the right place there. Good. (laughs) And he also knew that time would be similar. And so way back when he instituted practices and things that would help keep people free. Because he doesn't want your heart to be owned by something that's been gifted to you. You can't put your faith, your trust in your money. You can't put your faith and trust in your career. Everything can change tomorrow. You've got to be rooted and grounded in something much more than that. So to practice generosity, it's not about money at all. It's about reminding ourselves that God is in ownership of my heart. You hear me? The Bible talks about money a lot. A whole lot. Because we need it. (laughs) We need to be reminded often that we are just stewards. Everything we have is on loan. And praise God for that. So may we do our best to sow what we've been given into the kingdom. To things of the spirit. Are you hearing me? We're responsible for what we do with all we have. But may we never forget that we are the owner of nothing. We are just stewards. In conclusion, because it is 10.06, and I know you want donuts, all right? (laughs) Somebody snorted. That was good. (laughs) Chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary. Everyone say weary. Weary. In doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially, this is important, to those who belong to the family of believers. And here's what I want you to leave rehearsing to yourself today. Meaningful community does good and doesn't give up. Doing good will wear you out. You hear me? It does drain the gas tank. Making right choices time and time again can be grueling and hard. Praying for the kid who hasn't come back yet is grueling and hard. Trying to be obedient with your finances is good and it's hard. (laughs) Trying your best to steward all the things that you've been given is good, but it's hard. And over time, slowly but surely, that gas tank can just get more and more empty. Amen. Any of you today, you can be honest, any of you feel a little empty? I feel a little empty this morning. I got up and I did what my wife does every week miraculously and I got my kids ready and I brought them here and by the time I got here I was like, oh my goodness, I still have to preach. (laughs) Doing good, doing right over time, it can wear you out. And that's why you need two things. You need God's spirit and you need God's people. You were never designed to to carry it all by yourself. Doing the right thing consistently over a a long amount of time is difficult and taxing. That's why you cannot do it in your own strength. That's why we sow into the spirit and not the flesh. The flesh cannot sustain your good doing. Your flesh is weak. The spirit is willing. You hear me today? 
And so I'm just going to be honest with you. Some of you just need to hear this. Keep going. With your kids. You know, some of you maybe are even like new to church, faith, all that. You have no idea really what's going on. Keep going. Some of you have had thoughts about like, is this faith journey still worth it amidst all the unanswered prayers, amidst all the difficulty, amidst not seeing things move the way I thought they would move and change the way I thought they would change. Keep going. Some of you are like, yeah, I, I used to be really engaged in faith community, but I got burned really bad and really, it was really difficult. Amen. Same. Keep going. Keep going. Some of you are in here today quite literally grieving. Keep going. Josephine, and I know four kids is hard. <laughs> and you make it look easy. Keep going. Are you hearing me today? Stan and Kim, I know you carry so many things that none of us know about. Keep going. Dave and Paula, you're a gift to so many. Keep going going. Reggie, I know you question ministry all the time, just like I do. <laughs> Am I called? Am I not? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I not? How do I do this and be a good husband and a good dad? Keep going. You may not see the fruit today, but the book of Hebrews says that in due time, it will yield what? Peaceful fruit of righteousness. That if you don't give up, the harvest may not be tangible, may not be here, but hear me, the prize is worth it. The cost of doing it is a lot, but the prize is worth more in the end. Keep going. Keep going. Let's pray. God, as we come to you, Humbly grateful. I just pray that as your word goes forward, that some part of it in some way would penetrate the hearts of your people. God, I ask now that you would speak to each person who needs to hear from you. And that we would have the courage and the faith to obey. Whether it means sowing something, whether it means repenting of something, whether it means just saying, you know what, I'm going to do my best to engage in community. And I, I just feel this burden today. For, for seasoned believers in here, God, I pray you convict them to pursue mentorship, to pursue mentoring young believers. That you would lay it on them as a mantle that they can carry. And I pray God would be willing to engage in community. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Justin and you know the beauty of God as he speaks through his ministers is that we all heard that same word today and yet it hit us all in maybe just a little different place and that's the beauty of it because we can take his words put them into our hearts and as we allow him to speak through us he'll make a good work of it so please stand and join us in our last song